One of the chapters we skipped, and I'm sad that we skipped it, of course I'm sad that we skip anything because it's all cool stuff, um, was the central force motion chapter. And so central force motion is when you have a particle um, that's got a force that's always directed towards the origin. Pick the origin as the place the force is directed to. So the, the classic example is the Earth or any planet orbiting the sun. Um, the Earth, the, the sun is at the center of the solar system. Thank you, Copernicus. And uh, the Earth is pulled towards it. And so it's central force motion. Um, okay. Uh, now, you may know, you probably know, that things orbit the sun not in circles but in ellipses. Now uh, here I vastly exaggerated the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. Earth's orbit has a tiny eccentricity such that um, its orbit's almost exactly a circle. Mars, uh, you can tell it's an ellipse. Pluto, even more elliptical, but there's comets whose orbits are even more elliptical than what I've shown here. So they orbit in ellipses. What can we do with that? I don't know. But let's start by just doing the central force motion thing. So you've got the sun here, right? I'll draw the, the scrambled eggs or the sunny side up version of this fried eggs, I guess, whatever. And you've got something orbiting it in an ellipse. Terrible drawing, but whatever. Right, moving at some speed v. Um, so I'm going to call the mass of the sun capital M. I'm going to call the mass of the planet little m. Um, and the kinetic energy, you may remember when we did 2D polar coordinates, and I'm going to just work in 2D here because it turns out um, the orbit will entirely be in a plane when you have central force motion, um, is 1 half times m times, and here's v squared, is r dot squared plus r squared phi dot squared. All right, so I'm using polar coordinates. And we worked out that was the kinetic energy. Or at least that what d the oh and this should have been phi dot squared that d phi that phi dot or sorry v phi the component of the velocity in the phi direction was r phi dot so uh, and polar coordinates are sort of the more obvious thing to use here because there is a thing that's at the center and there's central force and so the direction of the force is always in the negative r hat direction right so polar coordinates make a lot of sense here so that's the potential energy and the kinetic energy is. Uh, minus g times the mass of the sun times the mass of the orbiting object divided by r, right? And that was very exciting, and so you can very easily make a Lagrangian out of this just by subtracting the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And what I'm going to do is let's do the Euler-Lagrange equation for phi, right? So partial L partial phi dot We'll do first is just um, that minus should have been a plus is just m r squared phi dot right and uh, partial l by partial phi and this really should have been partial um, is zero what a terrible l because no phi shows up anywhere in there and so if you do the Euler Lagrange equation right which is d by dt that's a d, not a partial, of partial L, partial phi dot, minus partial L, partial phi, is equal to zero, right? That's the Euler-Lagrange equation. So what that tells us is that d by dt of m r squared phi dot is equal to zero, or m r squared phi dot is equal to a constant. And it turns out you know exactly what this constant is, because we're treating the Earth as a point mass. So we're not including any rotational energy of the Earth. It's not, it, we're treating it as a point mass. mR squared is the moment of inertia of a point mass, a distance r from the axis. And then phi dot is the omega, right? I omega. This is the angular momentum of the Earth. Hey, look at that. Angular momentum is conserved in a central force motion system. Isn't that nice? So what I just did here, this is one of the things you sometimes do with Lagrangians, is you don't actually, I mean, I could take the derivative and get that phi double dot equals zero. Uh, okay, that's fine. But um, it's the same as saying that phi dot is constant, right? Phi double dot equals zero means phi dot is constant. And then I just want to point out that uh, you remember generalized momentum. So go back to section 7.6 of Taylor which we talked about quite a while ago, um, P phi is just defined to be partial L, partial phi dot, right? That's the definition of the phi component of generalized momentum. 
gardeners outside, you can probably hear the buzzing. If not, it's good. That's the definition of generalized momentum. Um, I just want to point out uh, when you read the Euler chapter, right? So right here, p phi equals constant means phi dot equals constant. Actually, it doesn't mean that at all because r can vary, right? But the only dot that shows up in here is phi dot. So p phi, the angular momentum, turns out to be phi, p phi in this case. And the Euler angle chapter, the p phi, I think, if I remember correctly, includes both a phi dot and a psi dot. Um, I have to go back and look at it. It's more complicated, so just a warning there. All right, so given that, um, we can go back and write the total energy. So instead of the Lagrangian, and I'm going to watch, I'm going to do something cheesy here. So we have that P phi is constant. Actually, let me uh, write it up here so that we have it. Um, equals M R squared phi dot, right? That is our constant, which I'm going to call L. Um, equals, equals, equals L, definition of L. Now, make myself some space. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of edit in place. That's not L anymore. That's not plus anymore. I just want to write um, the total energy of the system. So I could write E, the total energy of the system, is kinetic energy minus, or sorry, well, plus potential energy, but potential energy has a negative term in it. And I could rewrite this total energy as 1 half M R dot squared plus L squared over 2M R squared minus G M M over R. All right, now why did I do that? this term here. Well, first of all, you can just check the algebra, make sure I did it right. So L squared would have been M squared R to the fourth phi dot squared. Um, and so there's the one half is up front. I have to have an M to get rid of one of the M's from M squared and an R squared to make the R to the fourth go down to R squared. So the algebra works. Why did I do this? Notice having done this, I have an energy that is now a one dimensional system. The only variable in here is R. Now, if you object, wait, but there's a phi dot inside L. Yes. L is a constant. L itself is a constant. So there's also R's inside phi dot. It doesn't matter. L is a constant. So the time derivative of L is zero because right? it's a constant. So what I've got now is a one-dimensional uh, system just in R. Now, obviously, this isn't everything you want to know about the orbit because you want to be able to figure out um, where is it at different times in its orbit. But you can learn useful things just by looking at this. Now, Finally, remember, when we think about potential energy, uh, usually, so a one-dimensional system, the kinetic energy is going to depend on just x dot right now. Remember, in polar coordinates, kinetic energy is um, 1 half m uh, r squared phi dot squared. So um, I mentioned it's a, a linear one-dimensional system, then kinetic energy is 1 half m x dot squared, and potential energy is going to be some function of x. What's important here is that the potential energy, remember when we talked about conservative systems, the potential energy is only a, a function of the position variable, not the time variable. So if you come back here, and by the way, there's been an error all this time. This should have been squared all along. Sorry. Um, anyway, if you look here, this term here is just a function of, of position. So mathematically, forgetting where it came from, right, that this, this term, that this term here came from the kinetic energy in the phi direction, that's where that term came from. But just you look at it mathematically, this looks like it could be a potential energy, right, because it depends only on R. So in this one dimensional system that we have here, we're going to define this to be U effective of R, right, so the total energy now is one half M r dot squared plus this u effective of r. I could also make the Lagrangian just by subtracting them and work stuff out, right? <clears throat> so it's not really potential energy, but mathematically it works just like potential energy. And you can learn things about r dot and r double dot from this potential energy. And you can also learn things about what's a possible range for r. So um, what I'm going to do here now is plot. I'm going to make a plot of um, the uh, U effective versus R. All right, so I, the numbers, I, I, these numbers are actually meaningful, it turns out. I put in Earth's mass and Sun's mass and um, Earth's angular momentum, right? It's orbital angular momentum around the Sun. I ignored the spin, which turns out is tiny anyway. So if you put those in and then you plot U effective, so that's in units of solar mass 
astronomical unit squared per year squared as a function of distance, which is in astronomical units. So the AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, this is what you get. Now, here's an interesting thing. Notice that at R is 1 AU. That's a minimum of U effective. And you probably also know that the orbit, 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 that the Earth orbits in very close to a circle. So what that means is, given its angular momentum, the Earth is in close to the lowest energy orbit possible for it. Right? So circles are the lowest energy orbits for a given angular momentum. And given that angular momentum is conserved, now of course, how do you, well, okay, yeah, you, you, if you want to change energy, you have to change energy too, and then there's interaction that could change angular momentum, but whatever. For a given angular momentum, the circle is the minimum energy orbit. And so that's one reason why we sort of expect um, to find lots of planets in circular orbits. And then we actually found bunches of planets around other stars in elliptical orbits, but whatever. Most of the planets in our solar system, at least the real ones, not counting the dwarf planets like Pluto, <laughs> um, are in orbits pretty close to circles, right? Mars is a little spastic, but, you know, God of War, what do you expect? Um, but here's the other thing. For a given energy and given en angular momentum, um, that... All right, so for a given angular momentum, this whole plot is one angular momentum. For a given energy, if it's not exactly at whatever this energy value is here, it won't orbit in a circle. It's going to orbit in an ellipse. And so, so pick some energy, like 4 times 10 to the minus 5. Draw a straight line across here, and there's going to be turning points, right? So it can never get to here because then its potential energy would be bigger than its max total energy, and it can't get out here for the same reason. It's going to oscillate back and forth between here, and not like this is not... I mean, you could approximate as a simple harmonic oscillator down there, but here, obviously, this is asymmetric, right? And so when you're closer, the oscillations are going to go faster than when it's farther. And you actually see that when you actually look at the elliptical orbit. Look, it's going faster when the thing is closer. So it'll oscillate back and forth. So that just tells you that that's how R varies as a function of time. But this also tells you for a given angular momentum, um, there's this huge barrier that prevents you from getting all that close to the sun, right? And so this is why um, trying to actually fall right into the sun turns out to be kind of challenging because unless you can get down to zero angular momentum, um, it takes a huge amount of energy to have your orbit get close to the sun, right? This, this thing just keeps going up. It's a one over R thing, right? This is minus one over R squared out here and this is a one over R. Or do I have that backwards? I have that backwards. This is a, a 1 over r squared. That's a minus 1 over r, right? Look at the energy equation. So this 1 over r squared is an effective potential barrier um, versus getting all the way to the sun. And so to do that, you have to get rid of angular momentum. And so if you have some angular momentum in your orbit, it doesn't matter how elliptical it is, you can only get so close to the sun. Now, of course, again, if you interact, and when you get really close to the sun, there's tidal interactions, which you know can change the energy of things. It can actually circularize its orbits, it turns out. Um, stuff can happen. But this does give us a sense that, yeah, okay, angular momentum, the, the angular momentum of the orbit provides an effective potential barrier that makes it not get any closer than a certain distance away from the sun. Um, and I think, actually, the orbit that I showed you had, um, I think it, I'm not, oh yeah, the orbit that I showed you um, didn't have the same angle. Did, yeah, the orbit I showed you did not have the same angular momentum as the Earth. Um, it had a, I don't know if it was greater or lesser. All I know is it was different. I set it up so it had the same orbital period as the Earth. That was one year you saw in the orbit. And the same orbital radius as the Earth. So the uh, size of the ellipse um, was two astronomical units. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so this is just an example of effective potential. Um, it's a, a fairly straightforward example of effective potential, and it's one that we skipped. And it turns out central force motion doesn't have to be 1 over r squared motion. You can do any central force motion. But 1 over r squared is already very rich and interesting, and you get into conic sections and uh, ellipses and hyperboles and parabolas, um, and all kinds of crazy stuff comes out. It turns out if you want to solve for the orbit, which I did to make that plot, I finally figured out how do I... Um, update positions in Blender using Python, right? So I now have Blender as a visualization engine. Um, you can't just find an equation for theta as a function of time, or phi as a function of time. It's a transcendental equation. Uh-oh. So you had to solve it numerically. So there, in, in my code that I used to, to plot that planet, um, 
I had a little Newton method solver in there to figure out uh, what the right phi was at given times. Uh, so even with just the Earth orbiting the Sun, already there's all kinds of mathematical stuff comes into it, and, and the ellipses and all this fun stuff, Kepler's laws, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot there, but that is an example of where we use effective potential. So think about that when you're looking at the effective potential in the Euler angle chapter.